Oh, you're too kind, and you're too early. You haven't seen the presentation yet. Um, okay, so thanks uh, again to Ben for a great presentation earlier on. I feel I'm part of the local authority community now, an honorary one at least. Um, I'm going to talk about digital in the context of housing associations today. Um, so here's the agenda. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what digital is. I think some of you will already recognize that there's a problem with the D word in itself because it means many different things to many different people. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk also about setting your digital course um, and also look at some of the, the key investment areas within the housing space at the moment, you know, indicative uh, in the sense of what people are looking to uh, move forward with. We'll talk about uh, designing the digital business itself. Uh, I think Ben alluded to this, you know, it's, it's a big challenge in the way of working uh, for many organisations when you move towards digital. And uh, I think uh, one of the things you mentioned that I'll mention again is, um, you know, digital does represent an opportunity to uh, reinvent rather than re-implement. Um, so that's something that we'll discuss a little bit. We'll talk about organising for success. Of course, uh, we're all sat in this room knowing that much of this technology has solved these problems already. Uh, actually, it's all the other stuff that gets in the way. Governance, sponsorship, you know, we'll, we'll talk about those. I'm sure you've got your favourites. You can, you can chant them out. And then we'll talk about delivering digital change itself. Um, and um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm an agile advocate. Uh, there's only one game in town as far as I'm concerned for delivering this kind of uh, project, in fact most projects to be honest with you. There are a few challenges when using Agile, uh, particularly in the housing sector, suppliers etc etc. Um, and me, maybe even getting the business to come to the Agile party. I, I suspect Ben's got a few tricks up his sleeve to do that but uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then finally if you haven't got all the, the messages already we'll recap around some of the key challenges um, as well as you know, some of the, the, um, the keys to uh, achieving success as well. So hopefully that ticks the box, uh, and I think I should be able to make up some time as well for us. Or well, certainly ensure you've got sufficient drinking time post-match, which is important. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, these are days I'm independent, but I have worked for a number of consulting companies over the years. In recent years, I've done a lot of work in housing, um, also some work in the not-for-profit sector, uh, but predominantly my heritage is uh, telecoms and media, and particularly in the glory days of telecoms when you know it was the right sector, I was in the right industry, which was IT, at the right time in the mid-90s. So you know it was really exciting uh, stuff. Um, today, I still do some work in telecoms and media. And in fact, um, when we talk about digital in a second, I've got a couple of case studies from outside of housing um, that we can talk about, which would be interesting. Those are the sort of things I, I do. Um, what I will say, the kind of lofty, lofty roles in some senses, I'm still quite hands-on, so I was really pleased to see the Drupal stuff, because I'm a Drupal developer in my spare time. Um, and uh, next year, in the first half of next year, I'm looking to launch a, a digital agency with a difference. It'll be actually providing jobs and roles in Africa. Uh, you know how critical it is in, in some of the developing nations to provide those kind of incomes. And when one role there will support uh, anything up to a dozen people. So that's uh, just a personal ambition of mine. So that's that. Uh, feel free to contact me. All my details are there. Um, and if you go on my website, you can, you can get some more materials. Okay, so what is digital, uh, first of all? Well, I think we probably, uh, the older members of us, will remember with excitement when we placed our first Amazon book order. I still like to look on the order history and think, well, what was I ordering in the late 90s? And, you know, that was very much the beginnings of digital for, for many people. But, of course, over time, uh, the landscape has uh, radically changed. Today, you know, people are living their lives digitally. Um, interactions you know, is completely, well, we, we're learning we're not going to be talking to our spouses anymore. Maybe good in some <laughs> cases. Uh, talking to the bot instead. But um, 
very much uh, that's in the digital space. And of course, you know, even products today are, are digital and you don't need me to tell you about the Ubers and the Airbnbs, etc., of this world. And I think that sort of app and web facing bit is the very visible face of digital. There's another part to digital in my belief, which is actually how you provide the capabilities to provide those services in the first instance. So many of you will be going out into the cloud, whether that's infrastructure type services or whether that's application software as a service type elements. Oh, I think, you know, ultimately, whole business capabilities or logistics capabilities, quite a common one these days, you can get a whole thing signed up and integrate into your website. So I think that's also, a, you know, a key part. So uh, no presentation is complete without a Gartner quote, which uh, Ben has, you know, proved for me. So, you know, what Gartner is saying here is that uh, digital technologies have profoundly changed the way we do business. Uh, buy, work and live, they're altering society and continue impacting virtually all business functions and industries. So, in conclusion, what I would say is that digital is really a, a time period, it's an age, it's, it's where we've arrived today. It's lots of different technology. It can't be seen, and, and I think this is an important fact, as purely a business or an IT thing. Uh, and when we start talking about how to make this happen, uh, I think that's kind of obvious. And we've, it's a, even from two or three years ago, the business users, in inverted commas, that I interact with, are just, you know, completely, completely tech savvy these days. Um, so it's very much creating a different sort of environment. And essentially, digital is how we live our, our lives. What this does do, of course, this, this combination of being able to deliver um, through digital channels and deliver digital products and actually consume digital services, it really does give you a powerful opportunity to create new operating models. And this is where the reinvention comes in rather than re-implementing. Uh, and particularly in the uh, cash-constrained worlds that we live in, you know, there are some aspects that this may be quite interesting. You know, again, uh, you've seen this on every LinkedIn post in the last, uh, you know, six months, but um, the Alibabas, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, Facebooks, these are all really, you know, completely different operating models from what we've been used to. But because I've never worked for any of those people, let me tell you two digital stories for people I have worked for and been involved in these projects where they are changing their operating model. The first one is Labara, which you will know, I hope, as a provider of cheap calls to ethnic and migrant workers in the UK. Um, it was a standard sort of cheap SIM, put it in, top it up, rates aren't so good, so we're going somewhere else, throw away the SIM, get another SIM, that kind of cycle of events. Um, and over the last uh, few years, they've grown into a huge business, not just in the UK, uh, but also in six or seven other countries. Now, to deliver that kind of business model in country, what they have to do is strike up a relationship with one of the local operators, convince them to host their service, integrate into that operator's network, provide SIMs that are dedicated to that operator's network. All in all, it meant to launch in a country you really, realistically, you were talking between 18 months and, and two years to do that and spending many millions of pounds. Now, they have an ambition to be the brand of choice for a billion ethnic and migrant workers around the world by whenever it is, let's say 2020. It might be a bit sooner than that. Um, but there was painfully, they will never get there on their, in their current model. What they did is quite simple. You know, they looked at the... Uh, the Vipers and the Skypes and say, well, you know, our unique um, uh, element is our cheap, um, log you know, cost-based routing for international calls, which is all done from London. If we can provide a client on people's phones in whatever country, we can route over the internet rather than over the telephony network, um, the call back to London, do the cheap, base route, uh, cheap routing, but also, as you'll be familiar with Skype, you know, charge them for the international element of the uh, journey and use some of their local London technology to do that. The upshots of the 
of this is that they did develop that product. In fact, they bought somebody that had developed that product, um, integrated it in. In just less than two years, I think, or maybe two years, they've already rolled out to 30 countries. It's got very low runtime costs because this is an agile built product, very simple, very straightforward and, and dedicated in what it does. Um, it's quick to roll out. It's an OTT product, so over the top, so it's on running on the internet, essentially. So it's moved from something that they've been um, sort of uh, experimenting with, something they thought would be strategically important for them, and it's shooting up now to making a massive operational contribution. In the meantime, their standard big heavy telecoms uh, solution, it's all become about cost now for them. So they're trying to you know, move that down into that sector. Um, the other one, which I hope you'll also be familiar with, is Sky. So I, I worked on this. Um, they have a platform called Now TV. So they recognize that people's viewing habits were changing. They weren't watching the sort of linear type TV um, you know, through the uh, standard channels. Um, and that you know, very much people's uh, consumption habits of content were changing. So in answer to that, they developed Now TV. It's easy to access. You don't need a satellite dish, etc. It's coming in over the internet. £10 subscription model. If you don't want it next month, don't subscribe. You know, really, really simple. Um, and it's been tremendously successful uh, in the UK. Several million uh, customers. Um, and what I did on, on this project was look at that platform in a sort of Labara-esque type way and say, well, is this now an opportunity for Sky to move into other markets outside of the UK at relatively low cost? Obviously, you've got your sales and marketing costs, etc. Um, so I analysed their platforms and um, helped them determine the level of investment that was required to internationalise and localise that stack. And you may be aware that Sky also bought, Sky bought out Sky Germany and Sky Italy. And I think they're either launching now or they're just about to launch in Spain. I'm sure that would be the first of many rollouts and they'd be taking on the, uh, the Netflix, et cetera, of this world. So those are two you know, real examples of where people are looking at changing their operating models. OK. OK, so back to housing land. Um, so setting the course. I don't think there's necessarily a magic formula to this, but there are uh, a few things to do. I think hopefully whatever organisation you've got, you've got a fairly accessible uh, business strategy, otherwise we might, be, we might be in trouble already. That may have already made some assumptions about digital, but if it hasn't, now's the time to get involved and work with those business leaders to understand the, how digital can support delivering that strategy or define that strategy more. So coming to the reinvention element. Um, I think many things that housing associations will be, or typical things that housing associations will be looking to address are um, just some of the hygiene, right? Because actually some of the housing associations don't have terrific digital services at the moment. Some are better than others. So, uh, and there's a massive customer pull these days for online services. Driving up uh, customer satisfaction, so more integrated solutions, you know, combat some of the problems with uh, uh, repairs, which tend to be the, the number one call into housing associations. Uh, what's, what I always find really fascinating about housing associations is how they're diversifying. Um, and diversifying in different ways in the North and the Midlands versus London. Obviously in London, it's all about you know, sales uh, and shared ownership because you can generate the funds then to underpin what you're doing in the social housing space. Up north, where there's kind of less pull for some of the new developments, uh, they, I've seen housing associations running schools, running radio stations, I was telling somebody earlier on, all sorts of stuff, so really interesting. Um, and of course, those markets uh, work in different ways. You'll recognise that you know, market rents in particular is already quite digital, so you have to do that in that kind of way. We mentioned, again, that customer pull, but let's not forget the staff as well. You know, they're really keen. You know, once upon a time, you know, some sort of mobile device landing in an engineer's uh, hand was a, a real intrusion into how he ran his day, and uh, possibly a reason to strike. These days, people genuinely, genuinely want it. Uh, because they know it's going to improve uh, their day-to-day uh, -day lives. And of course, 
you know, everybody's trying to respond to the growing pressures on cost. I think if, you, if you're starting off in this space, it's a good idea to look at your customer strategy if you've got one. Um, also good to start considering service delivery models. So different housing associations have different service models. Some might be very people-based with people out in the field, your housing officers or your neighbourhood managers. Others might have gone for a more centralised model with a contact centre. Uh, but again, uh, digital technologies can help you uh, change your service delivery model or indeed have uh, you know, different service delivery models for the different segments of uh, customer that you support. And something we'll talk about in a minute, I'll talk about value chains and digital value chains, which is a way of you know, understanding what your organization uh, does. Um, as I say, could be more radical, start to look at the uh, new operating model. Uh, yeah, I think you, you, you shouldn't think of any of this as let's disappear for six months or 12 months. You, know, you just don't even have the, you don't have the time to do that. Um, so, you know, setting an initial strategy can be as, as quick as six to 12 weeks, in my opinion. You don't want it to last any longer than that. And don't forget, nothing's right first time. So we're going to be iterating through this and learning as we go. Um, and although I've used the, the strategy word, uh, is as part of that plan, let's not be afraid to uh, look at some smaller uh, opportunities first, get used to this way of working, see if we can use um, some, some digital tech just to solve some point problems, really just get, get the buy-in, etc. So don't think of this as the replacing ERP system project necessarily, though you can go there if you want. Okay, so I, I said I'd give you just an, a, a little insight into some of the areas where I see um, housing associations investing at the moment. And I'll, at the end, I've got one interesting comment on all of this. Uh, well, I hope it's interesting. Anyway, so um, digital channels, obviously, um, as people uh, try, and I think the, um, uh, the philosophy is those people that can help themselves, let's, in, let's give them the tools to help themselves. I think some housing associations have bred a very dependent type tenant. Oh, light bulb's not you know, blown, let's phone up the housing association, send out an engineer. Uh, you know, that's, that's painfully uh, not great. What housing associations, in my experience, generally want to do is to get people to help themselves, free up some time, so they can use that time more productively with those people that need that time, or indeed, you know, help uh, with any expansion that it might be having. Mobile working, again, um, really uh, key area um, for some housing, housing associations who have, you know, large uh, mobile workforce. Uh, let me categorize this, you know, because there's, there's two sorts of mobility in my, my view. There's the people that are out in the field uh, with the tenant or doing the repair. They need one style of solution, which is different from the office worker who uh, you know, can work from home. And you know, if you were doing the building decant, uh, as I did get involved with O2 actually in the Olympics. And what happened there is that they knew there would be problems because the rowing was in Slough or near Slough. What they did is they uh, made their entire workforce completely mobile. And to prove the point, they shut their head quarters down for a day. They told people not to come, by the way. There were a thousand people turned up. No, that didn't happen. Seven or eight people did turn up. But, uh, so that's the level of, of, of mobility they managed to, to deliver. Um, but I will say that um, mobile working is, uh, you know, it's not a question of re-implementing that word <coughs> form they used to use for doing the estate inspection. You know, it needs to be something that works the way the operators work or the field-based staff. I, I, you know, I despair when I hear housing associations say, or when I ask them about their mobile working, they say, oh, well, we've, we're on form eight of 120, so we're getting there. It's taken us six months. I think, well, you want to get your calculator out and see how long it's going to take to complete this. So this is where reinvention comes in. Uh, customer, obviously, uh, very important. I use the word customer deliberately because for many housing associations, they're not all tenants anymore. There'd be leaseholders, um, some of you that deliver community services, care services. Um, 
So again, people are trying to, I mean, the big thing on the customer front um, in housing associations is to try and get not only a single view of the customer and their interactions, but also the, uh, the, the, the delivery of, of service to them, so cases essentially. Um, I think what often happens is somebody phones up with a problem, it's recorded, sent to somebody else, and in, 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 in the first point of contact, often it would be considered as closed. It's not closed from the customer's perspective, of course, because the repair hasn't been delivered or X hasn't been delivered. But I think because of the nature of some of the systems and the processes, the siloed working, people do think it's closed. So again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But creating that single view is really important. Uh, I think people are doing some stuff with assets, uh, largely after kickings from the HCA who have demanded that people do get a grip of what their assets are. Interesting stuff there. I always love talking about this because if you're familiar, those of you who are not so familiar with housing, there's often a, you know, a long period where we're working with our local authorities to try and find some land. Um, you know, praise schemes, go through quite a long development phase. And you can imagine all the information and data that's, that's built up. And about six weeks before we're due to sell it or rent it, um, there's a mass call to arms that, oh, let's find the data and put it into the housing management platform rather than actually, uh, you know, take a very structured view and start to build up that property data. Even more bizarre things happen then when we get into the maintenance phase, when data comes out of systems, gets manipulated independently, doesn't feed back into the housing system, and the data's everywhere and you haven't really got a system, uh, your view of the truth. I paint a very bleak picture there. I, I, I know many of you are much better than that, but uh, that has been my experience in the past. Obviously, insight is a really key thing. Uh, we, we saw your Power BI slide, but uh, you know, the, if there's one thing that people are absolutely awash with, it's, it's information, but not really much uh, insight into what all of that means. I met um, somebody who was in charge, I think it was uh, assets, actually, at the Housing Association. I asked them, well, you know, how do you know that everything's going well? You know, have you got any dashboards or anything like that you use? He said, oh, yeah, very, yeah, I have, actually. And he got out a double-sided A3 piece of, piece of paper in microprint. So anyway, OK. Uh, then we've got smart homes. I'd really love to be talking about this even more um, because Paintly, the Internet of Things, uh, you know, represents some great opportunities. You'll already know that some of this tech is out there, OK, because you can go and get your hive thing and remote control your house, all that good stuff. You know, it is coming. I think some of the problems are how it's all packaged up for how housing associations consume it um, and some of the investment strategies they've got. But it you know, will be there. And I know one or two housing associations are doing some really exciting things with um, electronics providers like Panasonic and people like this. So that's, there's some real, some real interesting things happening there. We're, we're kind of nearing Ben's last slide with that one. Uh, and then, you know, finally, obviously, platforms. I think traditionally housing associations have had like, a lot of infrastructure in-house. In fact, a big part of their IT crew are focused on keeping the, the tin fed and watered and the, the wires buzzing and all that good stuff. Uh, I think the problem is that's a never-ending battle uh, these days. There are lots of work that has to go into that. And I think many now are beginning to turn to using cloud-based services to take away some of that strain so they can engage with more... Uh, business-facing uh, activities. Okay. Oh, I said I was going to say something really interesting, didn't I? Uh, I haven't got housing management on there, um, and the reason, or tenancy management, because we've got the customer and the proposition, and we've got the assets. And I think the way the the sector is evolving is the significance of the housing ma management platform is becoming less and less. And if you look at the capabilities it supports. Many of them, like things like ASB and tenancy changes and sign up, actually could migrate north into a, a CRM process and be much easier to implement in a mobile context. Also, some of the property management stuff in, in the housing platform could go southwards into a, a, I'm assuming there is a really great asset management system out there, by the way, I'm sure there is, uh, but could go south into that. And, and in, if you were to undertake that, all you get left with is uh, the rent accounting and payments side of things. And then you can start to look at commercial non-housing 
billing platforms and obviously payment gateways and things like that. There's a little nuance about service charge and rent calculation because that's quite complex, but many people in housing associations already do that on a spreadsheet or a specialist package because it is so difficult to do. Okay. I'm not saying the housing management platform is dead, by the way, but uh, it's definitely in mode two. It's in the tortoise mode, let's say that. Okay, so I said I'd talk a little bit about value chains, and the reason I want to talk about this is because in my experience, you know, people are missing a trick when they're coming bottom up and not looking at the big picture. They're missing a trick for lots of reasons. Uh, you know, you're fiddling with something, you're improving it by a few seconds, but actually the thing's still taking four and a half hours, right? So uh, let's come top down and in that context start to uh, look at changes that can be made and how digital technology can be used to support that. So uh, I call them value chains. Um, they're very high level business processes, if you like. Um, I've done here one here for the, the tenant. So people might get signposted to services, sent back to local authority to get on the waiting list and all that good stuff. Uh, we'll get some nomination from the local authority and then there'll be some allocation and, and, and sign up type activities. Um, if you are, interestingly, if you are selling property that's really the kind of lead through to sales process. And we can say the same, if you abstract it up a little bit, then actually that's, that's what it is. We're getting some prospects in, right? Uh, and then we're doing the sale there. Now I say that, you know, I know there's quite a bit of difference in the, in the data, et cetera, but when you start to think in that way, it opens up the possibilities to use, you know, commercial packages and not be bound to your housing platform uh, to do this sort of stuff. And then in life, then these are predominantly cases. Um, I think most, I put rented payments and repairs because they'll usually constitute, inquiries from customers will uh, constitute usually about 50% of the work for the housing association for their sort of tenant facing folk. So if you crack those two, make those automated, digital, a bit more proactive, you know, payment reminders coming out and all that kind of stuff, then uh, you could well be making some big inroads. So in order to make the change, you're going to have to understand uh, how you deliver things. Uh, I've, the graphic, unfortunately, didn't come out very well, but you know, customer journey mapping is a great, a great technique to deploy. You've really got to live things from the customer's perspective here, not from your perspective, because otherwise you'll just be closing off the call, right? Even though the repair is not done. Um, and, and it will enable you to you know, start to manage things to meet the, the customer's, uh, uh, ma manage the outcome to meet the customer's expectation. People's service delivery models today in housing are often hugely dependent on people because some of the failings in the, in the technology and to be fair, the process and the business itself. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to address that and give yourself more flexibility with that model if you want to have a kind of pseudo field-based call center type model. Uh, I was working with one housing association that has no call center. Sounds quite radical. Um, actually, the reason they don't have a call center is because their systems and technology were so poor, the um, call center would only be taking a message to send it to the housing officer who knew what was going on. Okay, so uh, sorting these things out will give you flexibility on the service delivery model. Um, I've said it 10 times, so I'll say it 11, reinvent above re-implement as well. Um, and I think when you start to digitize these value chains, you'll also have the opportunity to be more proactive in how you interact with the customer. So don't, I was talking to one housing officer the other day and he said 60% of his calls every day were people just chasing them up on why hasn't this happened and why hasn't that happened and when's the man coming? Now, you're not gonna eliminate all of those because some people are just like that, but you do have the opportunity if you're running the process in a more automated fashion through their preferred mechanism, contact mechanism, to send them an SMS or send them an email. Leaseholders often like emails uh, as their preferred contact method, for example. We could even get a bot in there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, okay, um, and as I've already mentioned, abstraction really helps. Uh, another tool I use quite a lot is uh, business capabilities. So this is essentially a model of uh, what it is that your organization needs to deliver its strategy. It's nothing about technology at all. 
you can, that's just a little subset of business capabilities that you might imagine would be required to deliver a repairs process. Yes, we need some appointment booking capability, of course. We need some case management to keep track of where we are in delivering that repair. Um, if it's happening on the web, or in fact, even if you've got a skilled operative uh, trying to sort this out, you're going to need some diagnosis type capability. Um, and uh, to that end, you might also have some knowledge management. I, and there may be others, of course. But uh, if you take a business capability led approach, then uh, you'll be able to create overlays on your big model, understand the system footprints, start to uh, reconcile some system boundaries, understand the, cap the, the capabilities, uh, strategic significance to you or its operational performance, and you can use it as a decision-making vehicle. And it gets people away from the tech then, let's sort it out from a business perspective, and then it's, we can sort the tech out. And, and business people quite like that, because the old CEO, he won't know what system X is and system Y, but he will know about rent accounting, right? Okay, organizing for success. Um, so uh, we've done our business strategy, hopefully as part of that, and with the digital work that you guys have done, there will be uh, an annual plan, corporate plan, service plan, whatever, you, whatever your favorite name for this thing is, uh, in existence. Uh, the bullet should come out three times to the left because executive sponsorship is super key. Uh, a lot of housing associations see what is truly a business change as an IT thing. So they say, oh, you know, we need to drive all our customers online. Hello, is that the, uh, the IT director? Can you give me an online system? See you in six months. And that's, that's, as, as, that's what they want to do. Okay, but it's not going to yield the best results. You know that. Um, so part of this journey, and we'll talk about that in a second, is getting the leadership on, on board and getting them to stand up to deliver that business change. Um, of course, things, things will change during the course of the year. So you have to, again, this sounds completely sensible. You have to manage the annual plan, but often things, uh, you know, the, the red phone gets picked up and, oh, deliver this as well. Can you squeeze in that? Um, and uh, those good practices around proper governance of the, the plan, balancing supply and demand, uh, seem not to happen as they should. Uh, great idea, obviously, to business case each element. I'd, uh, uh, I, okay, one or two housing associations I've been to uh, still don't seem to have got the hang of this, but uh, most have now, I, I'm pleased to say. Um, and I, I say this for effect rather than reality, but you know, there's no such thing as an IT project. I keep telling people this. Uh, you know, there are only business change projects. It so happens that some might be sponsored by IT uh, because they, you have to deliver some infrastructure, etc. Uh, but uh, that really is a, a mantra I stand by. And also another big problem for ha housing associations that does stop them from delivering change is that they don't, they're not always good at identifying the full cost of the change. Of course, they want to hear it's cheap, so they tend to forget they need to power in quite a lot of business resource into this maybe some additional IT resource. They tend to see the software infrastructure costs because they're out the door, right? Uh, but they don't seem to see that internal investment that's required. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, if you're in that position where they just don't, they never see this, you've got to get over that to, to deliver the sort of changes that um, you may want to. You've also got to um, right shape IT, as I put it. So I, I, I think traditionally, HA IT departments are quite infrastructural focused, quite service desk focused. More and more now they're recognizing the need to uh, put roles in to connect with the business, to have those discussions about, well, I've got to, um, uh, you know, we've got to take some cost out the front line. We're thinking of X and we're thinking of Y. Start to have those discussions uh, with them at the onset. So in fact, um, you know, projects arriving aren't news to you because you've worked in in defining those and, and defining how that could be done. Um, and it does mean then that you know, crucial roles for you moving forwards are those people that can engage around the solution side of things, uh, you know, application leadership and, and some development. I think there's some development you might want to keep close. But those, the, the, let's say the, uh, the Tortoise platforms, that might be a great opportunity for engaging partners. So you've got some you know, design authority over the whole thing. So don't let go of that in your outsourcing, but maybe look to those guys to take on some of that, to free up your headcount, to work on some of this other stuff. 
Um, and of course, uh, the other one I'd call out it would be, uh, you know, uh, vendor management. That's increasingly more and more important as you start to. Uh, I haven't spoken too much about it uh, so far, apart from the beginning. But as you incorporate more and more external services, then that's something you do need to get good at. Okay. So, delivering change. I think you got the message earlier on that uh, Agile's the way. Um, I, I like it, particularly in the housing sector, because it mandates that the business has got to pitch up, and that doesn't mean like once a week. Uh, that means they've got skin in the game. You know, if the, if the change is, if they're that convinced about the benefits of this project, there's no reason why they shouldn't commit people to this. Um, and a slight mistake on the graphic, of course, the Scrum Master and the Product Owner aren't usually the same people. So, uh, uh, another great thing is decision making. I went to one housing association that had a requirements committee that met every month or something. So, you can imagine what that was like. You know, uh, having an empowered person there on behalf of the business that was there to make decisions day by day, I'm not saying they wouldn't liaise, of course they would with some of the business areas, is, is really key. And of course, you don't know what you don't know. So to be able to demonstrate what things look like or could look like or could work, you're not waiting three months for a supplier to roll something off. You're actually getting real-time uh, feedback. And I think incidentally, it is also a, um, uh, as, as part of a, a startup, if you're considering an idea, it's often quite a good idea to sort of engage with somebody to work for two or three weeks, spin up a version of something that you're thinking about and, and build up your backlog from that sort of demonstration and working with business users rather than imagine some huge specification for 80 pages and we want this and we want that send it off to the supplier when you didn't really know anyway what the package could do. So you know, maybe that's one for consideration. Obviously the business uh, prioritise uh, things working with you. Um, you can certainly, uh, far from introduce risk, actually Agile often reduces risk because you can target those things that you're most worried about in the earlier sprints. So that for those of people that are not familiar with it, this is sort of two week, typically two weeks, sometimes a week, sometimes a month turn around uh, uh, working uh, slots, I should say, where at the end of the two weeks you aim, aim to have something demonstrable to show to the business. So you can use one of those sprints to tackle how you might integrate to your housing system. You know, if that's a big risk for you and you're doing some web development, let's get out of the way, let's prove we can do it and that will work before we've developed all the shiny front end and think, oh my God, we can't glue it in. Uh, and then we've got that kind of email interface that's going to a housing officer from the web, which won't be great. Um, and of course, you know, you get much higher quality with people's engagements um, and that incremental delivery. Uh, as I, I might have uh, alluded to, some of the key challenges are getting the business to the party on this one. So there's an education that you, you know, kind of need to, to do there, show them the way. Um, and suppliers as well who... Uh, frankly have already given their best price usually and are, uh, are off in supplier towers somewhere doing whatever it is that they do. Uh, that doesn't work because of course you can't phone them up and then you don't get a delivery the next day, it's going to be two weeks or whatever. Uh, there are ways of doing it, you can kind of treat them as, a, as an interface and then um, put the requirements in, kind of stub it out in, in dev terms. Um, and then uh, carry on developing and then their, their requirement would come in uh, you know, in the next sprint perhaps or something like that. So there are ways of doing it. Uh, if you've got a really great, if you've got a partner rather than a supplier, they may well land on site with you, which is obviously the best thing to do. Key challenges, so penultimate slide now. So, uh, I, you know, you can have your own favorite list here. Uh, seems to be a surprise sometimes to people that digital channels are always on. They don't operate nine till five, like, uh, the guys out in the field, so that's obviously an important uh, consideration. Uh, ways of working, double underlined, in bold. Uh, I think what you said about getting the right, I know there was a consultancy term about it, but getting the right kind of mix in a project team is really important. Because, uh, yeah, the, the old laggards have got some good knowledge, right? But you want to mix it in with some people who will actually question why do we do it that way? Um, and that's, that's going to be, uh, that's, that's a key one. I mentioned the mobile forms thing, it, it drives me nuts, I see it everywhere. 
Uh, housing management solutions themselves can be a bit challenging. Some are better than others. Um, so, uh, and in, in technology terms, that means they might not be that easy to integrate to and get data out of. You've already heard my theory about putting housing management systems on a diet. So putting some of it in CRM and some of it in, in, in your um, uh, property systems or asset systems. Okay, some skills and experience. Obviously, we're talking some different skills. And, and, uh, um, and again, you're going back to that, that mix. Perhaps bringing some people from outside the sector is a good thing sometimes. Um, ability to deliver change. Uh, we can write strategies till the cows come home. Uh, your ability to deliver that change is the defining thing. You know, technology has solved all these problems before. Um, what tends to get in the way is all this other stuff we've talked about. You know, the culture, ways of working, sponsorship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Data quality, of course, can be an issue. We, you know, we mentioned some of that property data going everywhere. Um, I was with an HA earlier. Um, and uh, I think some people's view there was, oh my God, this data's terrible, it's phone up IT. Actually, the data was going in in a very poor state anyway, so if you're fixing this stuff, don't forget to uh, turn off the tap so the bath doesn't fill up again with terrible data. Uh, classic, I'm sure you all do uh, you know, complete stock surveys every two or three years because the data just gradually degrades because various things happen and nobody bothers to update the systems properly. Um, it's a problem for everybody. You may well have some technical debt, which is uh, tricky. Um, and as I say, you know, making that make, uh, breaking that make do amend cycle is another sort of kind of mindset shift. And actually, you know, maybe it isn't so difficult, and maybe it isn't so expensive as they think. You know, people think it's expensive, but some of this tech and ways of working, you can turn things around a lot quicker and potentially cheaper than you did before. And yeah, get people to sponsor stuff. So finally, key ingredients for success. You know, if you're going to do this and you've got to get that uh, top-down buy-in, I'm not saying you can't demonstrate digital success locally to try and engender that, but uh, that's going to be really key. You know, if your leadership don't, you know, don't believe in any of this, then you're really in, in a spot. You know, definitely you need a plan. This is a completely inclusive thing. It's absolutely an online IT thing. And staff have a big role to play. You know, people are very tech savvy today. Um, and they'll have used all these other services that we're talking about and they'll have great ideas as to how things can, can happen. Definitely think outside the box. Um, you know, business case. Customer focus, absolutely. Um, one thing that I, it always fascinates me is is the beginnings of the relationship typically with a tenant are in that uh, allocations nomination type phase. Interesting, often with the local authority, they've already begun that journey in a digital way because they've had to do choice-based lettings and things like this. Why housing associations then choose not to run the rest of that onboarding process in a digital way uh, is beyond me. And uh, you know, hopefully people are starting to look at that. Maybe some of you guys already are in the room, which is, which is great. Because again, it sets the tone for the relationship for moving forwards. And of course, because you do need to spend time with a tenant, even in this digital scenario, you can do that assisted digital thing, which is great, because you can, you can do it sat with them, showing them the solution, and then hopefully they can pick it up and, and use it for web self-service. Okay, uh, do all this uh, fast and iterative in true, true agile uh, style. I, I, I would get a bit panicked if, if somebody wrote a digital transformation strategy and first thing we're going to do for six months is go off and find the big supplier, things like that. Uh, definitely, uh, the, you know, the changing environment means that we're moving much more to a kind of assemble and integrate sort of mode rather than build mode. So again, that's part of that skills uh, mix. And, you know, find some great partners as well because, uh, you know, that will make a a real difference for you. So, uh, ooh, not too bad. It's not quite last orders yet, but uh, yeah, hopefully that was interesting. Uh, gave you a little bit more insight into the housing sector. You know, also uh, checked some of the, you know, Ben's stuff. It's absolutely not the last word on digital, of course, but hopefully those observations and, and insight and thoughts will help you on your own digital journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.
Oh, hello. Hello. Um, I was uh, IT director at Thames Valley Housing, and we did a lot of yep. a lot of web stuff. Yeah. Mm. online services. Um, when I originally put some money in the budget, mm. some of that was for upskilling the in-house um, mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. uh, both of you touched on that some staff will expect that they can, they, they're doing stuff online at home, mm. they're expecting to be able to do it at work. But, um, but I think you in particular touched on the fact that quite often the least digitally literate people are the directors. Mm. So what have each of you done in terms of getting people up the learning curve so they're not terrified of doing things in the cloud mm. so that they understand? I mean, I remember having a discussion with one of the directors who said, you know, my email's been spoofed. Mm. How can we stop that? And I said, well, Lloyd's mm. Bank can't stop it. I've had some, mm. some junk mail that purports mm. to come from Lloyd's mm. and it doesn't. And I'm just, you know, literate enough to mm. know that that's rubbish. So, mm. What have each of you done in terms of getting staff to understand okay. basically the modern world? Um, well, I'll let Ben add a few thoughts in a second, but uh, you know it is a, a tricky one. I, mu I must admit, I'm meeting less and less execs like that. That's that's the good news. Um, <coughs> I think uh, you know, in some senses, they can be uh, they can be led by the by the staff, and, and you know, seeing what the staff are doing and seeing what the staff are achieving. I remember the excitement at Sky, which you'll know is a very digital organisation. Um, uh, it wasn't Yammer, they were using Chatter, I think the Salesforce uh, equivalent. And they put this out and they didn't really know how it was going to be used. But what they discovered was the call centre agents very quickly realised this was a fantastic tool. And there's several thousand of those. So there would be a particularly tricky case coming in, like we want to put a satellite box on a you know, block of flats or something. And the, the customer service agent would say, oh, I don't know how to handle this call. Within seconds, she, she, and typing it into the, the chat, she would get uh, responses back. Similarly, uh, working at a housing association you know, we, that had a failing implementation of a housing management platform, uh, we worked on converting that into an agile-based product Immediately, the chief exec started to see the change, uh, and it, it, we, after a year and a half, or however long it was, within three months, he had his product live, right? Which was, you know, tremendous news for him. He got very excited about it and used to come down to the stand-ups, uh, and he used to refer to Scrum as scrimmaging. It was obviously a bit old school, but anyway, you know, it's that sort of thing, creating that buzz, creating that excitement. I think staff have got a role. Uh, in that, and IT have got a role as well to try and bring them along. No, I don't have a magic answer. Ben might have a magic answer. No, I don't think it's that. But also, we really used uh, kids on work placement. Mm -hmm. For instance, we had a, we had, I had to present a corporate leadership team about digital transformation internally with the GTA, some of these really kind of uh, grumpy exec, execs there who, you know, are almost trained in this, what's it all for? Huh? They don't want to admit they don't know how to do this stuff, they can be embarrassed. Well, when, when you've got a, you know, an 18 year old girl, you know, answering those concerns, well, why don't you just do this? Why, you know, it's so obvious mm. to that, why don't you just, why, if, you know, if you've got that, why don't you use, I don't know, some you know geotagging tool that is ubiquitous in social media to actually capture where people are reporting these things. You know, it changed some directs us into really a shutting up and b thinking I better get with the program here. Um, so that's that that's a bit harsh. But that the thing about leading from the top and then using millennials, the younger generation, to start to recalibrate the expectation about what we do with our ideas and what we engage with. Some are very good though. I was speaking to the chief exec recently and uh, she was uh, telling me, my bloody mother, my 80 year old mother is online doing this and this. Why can't I just press a button and get a repair? You know, you know there's lots of reasons why not, but at least thinking in the right way. Okay. Hi. Um, one of the challenges you just showed was um, how to, you know, the, the need to manage change. Yeah. I'm currently managing a project to digitalize uh, the whole of shipment private sales. Right, okay. The housing association. Yeah. So we're looking to do the end to end yeah. website. Okay. We're implementing that and so on. How, in your experience, have you or other housing associations dealt with that resulting change that comes up? 
either internally or externally? Okay, uh, change in the sort of business change? Or well, you say everything is just, oh, okay. yeah, I mean, a yeah. lot of it is business change. How you know, we'll, let, we'll, we'll get them to engage with us away from the customer, from the contact center digitally, mm. all the way from the initial inquiry okay. through to it was shared ownership, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. shared ownership. Okay. Well, I think part of that, no, well, I think part of that in establishing that you are, and those would be new customers generally into you, at the beginning anyway, part of that, you're setting the pace, aren't you? You're, you're saying this is a digital experience. I guess probably the, the challenge that immediately springs to mind is the post that sales process, they might drop into the, the bad old world uh, where they have to pick up the phone and, and do all those sort of things. And of course, in that, in that direct sales space, and indeed some of the shared ownerships, uh, this, this challenge of mixed tenures comes in, where you've got people that have spent, well, I know housing associations that sell million pound plus properties, right? And there comes with that price tag an expectation that things can be done in a certain way. I think that's really the challenge. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I... I don't have the answer for that in the sense that, you know, those people will need repairs in the same way as other people will need repairs. They will definitely want to do it through other channels than the housing officer phoning up the housing officer, right? That I can be pretty sure of, or leasehold officer, whatever. So, um, and they will also be much more focused on things like service charges. So having visibility of that is often a, a, a key thing. So I think it's, you know, understanding the audience and also having a pathway then to start painting in the other parts of the, uh, the picture. I think actually delivering the change, if you've got the right kind of mechanism, I don't think there should be any issue there because you're working with people to define what that experience should be, doing the journey mapping, hopefully, things like that. Um, I'll talk to you after because we actually did, mm. we did that. Mm. I mean, one, what we did in terms of getting the sales process working properly was insist on having a, a really good member of the sales team yep. work with the IT team, um, you know, um, yeah, absolutely. Not, um, and then in terms of the post-sales experience, mm. there was a there was an estate which was completely divided mm. between leaseholders mm. on literally one mm. side of the fence and um, people from the other side of the fence not able to use the shared facilities, not able uh, to park in the same car parking spaces. Yeah. And the, um, the neighbourhood team did some really strong work to mm. build those teams together. So I'll put okay. in touch with someone. Yeah. Okay, thank you.